Pioneer brand canola with Optimum Gly, the highest yielding glyphosate tolerant trait on the market. What's next in canola happens here. Experience the most efficient system for delivering sulfur and phosphate to meet your crop's needs with Smart Nutrition MAP plus MST. Welcome to the Truth About Egg. Welcome back to the Truth About Egg podcast. I am your host, Evan Schout, with my co-host, Christian Hebert, and a special guest today. So before we start, remember, like, share, subscribe, comment. And while I got you here, I want to plug a little bit of Farmer Coach. Look for a new cohort starting in November, as well as Maverick Egg, any of your financial consulting, please reach out. So today we got a bit of a special guest, and, and I don't know a lot about you, John, so I'm going to let my co-host do quite a bit of the talking but i am going to try and jump in once in a while obviously i met you at the farm a couple weeks back or a few weeks back so from my standpoint give me uh give me your background because i don't know enough about you to even start asking questions yeah well th thanks for uh bringing me into the conversation uh guys i'm looking forward to a good uh good discussion um so I've been lucky, fortunate enough to be around long enough to have done a few uh, wonderful things uh, with the life I've been given. Spent a number of years slash decades as a journalist, uh, was a reporter and foreign correspondent for the Globe and Mail, spent uh, most of the 1990s uh, living in India, writing about Asia and Africa and the Middle East. Um, went on to become the business editor of the Globe and then the editor-in-chief uh, up until 2014, and uh, then came to RBC, uh, where I've been uh, coming up to uh, coming up to 10 years building something that we call economics and thought leadership, which is r really an effort by RBC to understand the economy, understand the big issues from trade to immigration to artificial intelligence that are shaping the direction of the Canadian economy like beyond the next quarter, like where, where are we heading into the 2030s? And that includes climate. So I get to spend a lot of time on uh, uh, understanding well, what climate is doing to the economy, what climate change is doing to the economy, uh, but also trying to understand and, and inform as best as we can uh, Canada's uh, climate policies and what are many, many clients from farmers to food processors to oil and gas companies to transportation companies are doing uh, uh, in terms of their own climate policies. So we bundle all that into something called the RBC Climate Action Institute. So, so what you're saying is we're lucky we you had made some time for us today. <laughs> no, I, I feel like the, the, the lucky one to uh, be, uh, be on this show. Yeah, I, you know, <clears throat> Truth About Ag podcast, and we have a, a Globe and Mail, past Globe and Mail editor-in-chief and, and a current vice president at RBC on, and some of our listeners will wonder how does this, how does this tie to agriculture. But um, I think the other thing we do a lot on the podcast is, is I read an article, I don't know, maybe a month or so ago, Evan, you could probably clarify it for me, but it, it's called The Conspiracy of Awesomeness. And really what it is is just very curious individuals um, that that I think are trying to make every day better, and it, it really hit home for me because I I realized that that you know that's one I'm addicted to business, but I'm addicted to curiosity and this conspiracy of awesomeness. People that are just trying to make things better, and and if I go back to the kind of the first couple times we met, John, I I, I would say that's to be honest why I why I keep reaching out, and then the more I learn about you, the more I find it kind of ties into a bunch of stuff Evan and I talk about. So I'm going to go back a few years to start and then we'll move into more current topics. But the one interesting thing that I've learned about you is you, you took a business degree, um, but, but had this creative urge. So kind of jumped out of the world of your first business job into, into newspaper writing. And I think you did a little bit back in college itself. And, and it's funny because Evan and I talk about this to say, you know, if, if you have a child that wants to come back to the farm or be in agriculture, maybe don't always just look at an agriculture degree. Like, how do we round that out? And so, you know, I think uh, I'd just like you to talk a little bit about 
how your business degree has helped, you know, fuel your creative edge and, and everywhere you've been. And then also uh, you can weave in some of your India time and how that global view of Canada has really helped kind of shape your purpose. Yeah, that's a, a, a great question. Uh, and, and you're taking me way, way back in time. But uh, yeah, I did a, a commerce degree um, and enjoyed it, but really loved writing. I started to work on the student paper, became editor of the student paper, worked part time at the local newspaper as a copy editor and actually got a job in business coming out of uh, school, but just felt like very quickly I, I got to go chase my passion of uh, of newspapering and um, I think caused my parents uh, hair to gray pretty quickly and <laughs> gave up a, a good full-time job uh, to scratch my way into journalism um, but I only discovered through time like over, over the years how valuable that business degree was to journalism and I've, I've never studied journalism uh, rightly or wrongly but found that the fundamentals of business, so I, I was able to write about business and actually started as a business reporter. Uh, so I understood business, but it was the critical thinking of business that really helped me in journalism. Um, things like, believe it or not, uh, stats um, was, was incredibly helpful. Not that I ever did like regression models for a, for a story, um, but the mental discipline of a regression model and just understanding what you are trying to do with data was really good to how I would think about a story, how I would structure an interview. Um, interviews are in kind of a weird way like a regression model. Uh, and it, it wasn't deliberate that way. I just kind of over time thought, Wow, that's kind of helpful. I'm fl having flashbacks to um, to stats here uh, or accounting. Um, um, it, just the discipline of accounting, um, <laughs> like the, the the very basic of balance, uh, is actually fundamental to lots of things. It's fundamental to running a farm, but it's also fundamental to reporting a story or or thinking about. You know, creating a digital website for a, a newspaper, you have to think of um, assets and liabilities uh, in all sorts of different different terms. But it just brings that kind of mental model to uh, to another sector. So all to say, the the, the rigors of, uh, of 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 business school, of case studies, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, just of that critical thinking was really uh, helpful for me in, uh, in journalism and in, in being able to connect that with maybe uh, some of the more creative side of, of my brain. And then you mentioned India. Um, was really fortunate to be there in the 1990s, right after my wife and I, she's a photographer, so we were working together and we arrived right after the country opened up economically. And it was a, such a powerful, life lesson for me in the power of markets because India was a you know, socialist economy, planned economy. Um, first thing I tried to do moving there was get a phone and it was a five-year waiting list to get a telephone line. This is in like 1991 and you, know, you had to go through days of applying like paper forms. Uh, it was crazy unless you you know, managed to know someone in the system and give them something and then suddenly you had a phone. I thought, wow, this is a really inefficient, almost Soviet-esque model. And then India liberalized and privatized the phone market. And I've never seen anything like it. I just suddenly, like in three years, there were phone booths in every little village I would go to, uh, run by some little entrepreneur um, who was like a subcontractor to this new private company. And then cell phones came along and on. Um, so just to be in a country, in an economy, to watch it go warp speed through economic liberalization is something I never want to forget because it showed the power of human ingenuity, the power of the markets, and we'll talk lots about also the risks and problems of markets. They're not perfect, but boy, they sure beat government planning. Uh, and I hope not to not to forget that. Just the the individuals. We're all human. Uh, we all like to create. Uh, we're good at trading <laughs> with each other. 
uh, and when governments get out of the way, um, except for you know many of the important parts of what governments do, it's awesome. There, this is a conspiracy of awesome, uh, Christian. Yeah. Is, uh, <laughs> it is awesome. Market. I've written that down as uh, something I want to something I want to read because you you gave me a book, Christian, called the the Twin Thieves, um, yeah. which was uh, was it was great. It was great. So, thank you for that. And, uh, yeah, I've got a good. You eye. know it. I think uh, I think two points come out of that, hey, Evan. I mean, the one is what we see lots in in our kind of our favorite entrepreneurs, and I'll use entrepreneurs too because I'm going to go into that next. Is you know we always say that business is just it's like sports, right? Nobody nobody woke me up to play hockey at 6:30 a.m. when I was young. I just did it because I love it, and I, and I, to be honest, I I don't feel any different about business, right? I, Evan would get mad at me because I don't really pay myself. I just kind of take money when there's money and, and just get up and go do what I love every day. But really what it is though, is I think that group of people doesn't see problems as problems, right? There's too many people in the world that you see a problem and it just stops life. That's all they can focus on. They can't get by it. And I, and I do think that commerce degree and the business background, whether that's through mentorship or university, really like a problem is just a pivot point in the game. It's like being on the penalty kill. You, you just find a way to get through it and go back to normal life, right? And But it's just a challenge. It's not a, a stop, right? And I, So I think that was kind of a unique way that I saw how you explained how you used it in, in journalism, right? Just take the good parts and then the critical thinking and balance. Now, if you could maybe get the federal government to understand balance of assets and liabilities, that'd be great too. But I don't know how long your career plans on lasting. But um, the second piece, I think... But Christian, that's a really important point for like us all just to continue to to stress to our kids, to new, new generations, as well as remind ourselves that life, everything in life is about balance. And I've, I've actually learned that. I didn't learn it. I, I see it so clearly in banking. I mean, banking is nothing more than balancing, right? Uh, yeah. And and when you lose balance, uh, and we've seen this in banks that that uh, have are no longer with us uh, in, in, the, in the United States, they lost that sense of balance. We lose that in the economy. We lose that in our personal lives. But yes, governments um, yeah. have to find balance as well. Nothing yeah. is sustainable without that that long-term balance. Well, well, and and, and the interesting part, Heaves, is that, I mean, you've, I've heard you say it a million times, is the uh, the whole thought process on having control versus not control or the direct control. like. You're a recovering accountant. I mean, you use that joke a million times. I've I've actually stole it from you, and I use it in every speech I do. But it, it comes back to, yeah, we we both have a CPA, we both have the accounting degree, but neither of us practice that on the daily. It's it's essentially comes in when you have a problem, and you, instead of going to that, I've got no control. It's the environment. It's it's government. It's whatever you want to put under that rock. You come back to no, I've got control. It's a strategy. It's a risk management. It's a it's a mathematical equation, right? So commerce yep. always comes back in. So I, I find that the interesting part of you, you followed your passion, much like Christian's done as, as and I honestly say I've done is get out of commerce and into something else, but you always differentiate back and bring it back in because it, it actually applies to more than just accounting and numbers, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think the other, the other neat point too is we haven't talked about this much on the podcast, but I mean, I, uh, so obviously entrepreneurs always kind of support each other and, and I think there needs to be more of that. But in today's world, I think entrepreneurs are as important as entrepreneurs. And I mean, I think you're a great example of it. I've talked about a good friend of mine, Wayne Paprosky at MNP, a good example of it. And, and what I say is that like, they're just, they're just entrepreneurs that got, got caught up in really good positions that they love doing for, for big companies, but they're, they're every bit as important as, as entrepreneurs. And, and you, you can see it, you can see the excitement of business and of our country and of success come out of you when you speak. Like when you're telling the India story, you can see that the, that conspiracy of awesomeness just makes you smile, right? And and so I think we act, you know, personally, I actively seek out entrepreneurs with inside the companies that I deal with or the progress programs that I deal with. And and I would say, you know, I think I think it was your podcast we first met, but then, you know, our, our friendship kind of went on speed after that between between Kanza and COP and, and everything else. So um, I'll lead this into, so how did how did thought leadership at RBC all of a sudden, in my mind, really take agriculture and kind of put it up in, 
in one of their top, I, I'd say top four priorities, but I would argue that it's more this natural resource priority that has become a real big thing for RBC. And, and we've talked about this lots, right? The Canadian Business Council, everything we think natural resources. Um, and for me, I mean, it's exciting for me to see not only RBC, but to see someone like you and your team putting out thought leadership and research and spending time on agriculture. Um, love, love to talk at length about that. So the the roots of thought leadership at RBC. I mean, in some ways it goes back m more than a century. It's almost as old as as, as as the bank. But when Dave Mackay came in as CEO a decade ago, and he's he's a lifer at uh, RBC, he started his career here. Um, he has a vision for the bank and for the, um, and in, in some ways for the country, for the economy, and he and I. Had, known each other previously and we're talking about what he was aiming to do as CEO and helping Canada prosper was was really important to him and there's there's um, self-interest in that like if Canada doesn't prosper RBC is going to be challenged um, we need our home market to grow and thrive more than it has been uh, and it can like it this is a solvable problem uh, so how do we help the country? It's not on us to run the economy or make decisions um, for, for governments, but we can inform. And governments and industry groups and lots of clients come to us for insights beyond kind of banking products and services. Uh, so with, with that aspiration of helping to inform and maybe even inspire Canadian prosperity, uh, we created this unit that I get to oversee, which includes our amazing economics team uh, who study the economy, um, but also policy researchers um, on different different sectors. And very early on, um, as, as we were kind of looking at what what's Canada's economy going to be like in the late 2020s, so this is going back 10 years, um, resources, but agriculture and food was top of the list and we just it, it was always striking to me how Canada is a great ag power and we don't act like one uh, we export food and fertilizer and energy and lots of other things to the world um, and, and we get paid for it but like we don't think about it strategically so we thought okay we, we need to lean into this resources opportunity for the country and agriculture is is is, is critical uh, we think we did a lot of research on this we feel Canadian ag exports can grow like 25 percent by the 2030s uh, the world you guys know this your listeners know this like the world needs Canada to produce more um, process more export more uh, and the, the better we are at that the higher quality that we uh, that we export the, the 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 more we'll make uh, doing uh, doing it, but it's unfortunately uh, if food is something we all are intimately knowledgeable about, um, but uh, we kind of take it for granted or don't even know that we are this awesome food uh, food ex exporter. So that was the the impetus of of that, and we've added a full time ag policy lead, which I think is. Pretty cool for a bank. Uh, someone who's like, we've got a great ag banking team, teams of teams across the country who know agriculture incredibly well. Um, but this person just focuses on um, uh, Lisa Ashton is her name. She's got a PhD from Guelph, uh, farm girl from southwestern Ontario. Um, she and I were at Christian's Farm uh, in August, uh, along with a group of other uh, food executives. Um, uh, that's an indication of what we're trying to to help the country with is to explore ag policies, um, research, uh, connect different groups. It's always amazing how governments try to talk to each other but don't, or even departments within government don't. Yeah. Uh, and that's uh, that's also something that uh, RBC is, you know, sometimes able to help with um, if we're talking to a finance department about fiscal balance issues for instance uh, we can we can share a lot of uh, stuff on on uh, on on agriculture and just uh, as the last point on that uh, if I can share 
uh, a story from some years ago. Um, we we had uh, done a big report on, uh, on 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 these issues and the and the potential of ag, and someone in the federal finance department, someone senior, said to to me, "We get it now. Uh, we thought this was just you know Ag Canada always lobbying for <laughs> for more." <laughs> yeah. Like sounded like they just tuned them out. Like here comes Ag Canada looking for for more, or the the X Y Z Association uh, coming for more. They said, "Well, if RBC is seeing it this way, maybe it's something we should take more seriously." And and that's where I saw the initial push. Like the, the Farmer Four Point report was probably the first time that I'd seen not only not only a bank, but let's just call it outside industry come in and start writing reports on you know, those key areas of agriculture that we needed to fix, whether it was, I mean, that one was agriculture workers, education, investment, the equity or the markets, the exports. Like that was the first time that I saw you guys actually put the thought leadership out. And I think obviously lots of farms read it, saw it and agreed with it. So it was, it was interesting to see that the change a bit as industry started taking an interest more into agriculture, as you said, and not just not just from a perspective of programs and, and as you said, Ag Canada and that stuff, but from a, how do we make it better as a group? Because the, the one line that stuck with me, as you said, we were trying to fix, you know, we were trying to get the industry in Canada moving forward, not just our business. Yeah. And, and I see that with a lot of farms nowadays is they're, they're not just focused just on them. There is an actual push of telling our story, whether it's a Jake Legee or Christian or somebody else of actually trying to get the real story out and to pull the industry forward instead of just themselves, right? There's also yeah, a, a huge imperative around climate, uh, which oh. is, is, is a big part of, of our work and something not enough Canadians appreciate is that agriculture, again, back to that point about balance, when we talk about net zero, which is the challenge of balance, agriculture is this enormous asset for us uh, in terms of soil sequestration, uh, being able to absorb carbon, not all the carbon that we emit, but a, a decent chunk of it. Uh, we are already absorbing through enhanced soil practices. Um, you guys are a great model of, of, of that. And we need to, we're re really excited about the opportunity to develop economic models that reward farmers for what they preserve as well as what they, they, they produce. But Canadians, by and large, don't appreciate that we, you know, we have one of the world's greatest soil assets. Um, soil bases. I think it's fifth largest in the world. Uh, it's already doing a lot of the heavy lifting for uh, for sequestrate for carbon capture and sequestration, as some might call it, uh, and can do uh, can do a lot more. A lot more. So it's um, it's uh, it's a huge national asset. Yeah, I think I would. We're going to dive right into cans and carbon, but for the listeners, John mentioned, you know, I would encourage you to follow John and I would encourage you to, he mentioned Lisa Ashton, came out of Green Farmers of Ontario, if I remember correctly, I got a lot of respect for yeah. them. Good friend, Mark Brock, used to, uh, used to chair it for a long time. Um, they do really well in Ottawa, but Lisa, make sure you follow her too. And a quick little story on Dave, right, Mackay. So I'd, I'd, I'd only met him once. John phones me up and says, so we're going to do the AGM at the, in Saskatoon. If you want to do a, fireside chat with Dave. Yeah, sure, what are we talking about? Well, just agriculture and stuff, you'll be fine. So that, that was our guidance, right? And uh, and I, like I said, met Dave once in a big meeting. Um, so this is a pretty small setting, 200, 250 people. Um, and uh, we're doing a fireside chat and I'm like, well, typical Christian, I'm gonna throw something out to see how Dave answers it, right? So basically, kind of admitted I don't do a ton of business with RBC, but got a lot of respect for John. So Dave, you kind of get a lot of respect with it, but you know, you're a bank focused main, like mainly in central Canada. I know you have branches everywhere, but headquartered in central Canada. Um, and we're talking about agriculture and, and Dave, he didn't miss a beat. And he looked at me, he puts his hands up in the air and he goes, I don't understand a banker from Eastern Canada saying I'm here to help and you don't trust me right away. And I can't remember which president said it. It might have been Reagan. I can't remember. But like, I, I started laughing on stage because it, it was one of those questions that you never quite know how a CEO is going to take, right? The ones that, the ones that are more worried about themselves than their company and the country. Actually, you can see the perturbedness in their face. 
And and Dave just grinned and took it and came right back with a barb that had the whole crowd laughing. And right then I was like, I like this guy, right? And, and I've had a lot of conversations with him since. And you truly, I mean, nobody can understand the, the, the responsibility he has running a company that big. But I would 100% agree with you every meeting I've had with him. He, he truly wants Canada to capture the opportunity of being a natural resource superpower and, and all the things that fall out of that, right? You can just see that passion inside them to help enable that. So sometimes we don't do enough, you know, giving credit to the right people. And, and I think, uh, obviously we got you on the podcast, but Dave and Lisa are, are some people our, our uh, followers should watch. Now, uh, now I'll jump into, so obviously our, our first couple meetings um, led into to you and a, and a group of companies starting the Initiative Kansas, the Canadian Alliance for Net Zero Agriculture. And I'm gonna let you explain it and, and kind of go through it. But I, I, I get a lot of questions and kickback because to be honest, some farmers are like, Christian, you know, <clears throat> why the hell are you working with anybody about climate? It's all a scam, right? Um, what I would say is I wasn't interested until who I felt some of the right companies and then some of the individuals that you brought in in those companies were involved. Because um, then I felt it could actually make change and actually could have some, some differences within policy. And at that time, two things happened. One, you introduced me to some fairly large conversations globally that really made me realize the billions of dollars um, that are ready to be deployed in this space and we just haven't given it an active market or an active way to do it. And then two, the real feeling I got from this group of companies that they did feel agriculture was an asset and could be one of the best things Canada has to showcase around the world for what we do to climate. And, and I don't like the word regenerative because we in agriculture didn't get to make it, but we've had that problem our whole life. But I mean, zero till is like the number one thing and there's nobody better at it in the world than us. And yet everybody talking about it doesn't even know what a zero till air drill looks like. They don't know that it was born in Langbank, Saskatchewan, 30 miles from my house, right? So you, you go on your Kansas rant now, that's my, my, my lead in. So, so the o origin story of Kansas was Dave, uh, and I think it's always worth remembering, most CEOs are problem solvers. They're, they're just curious, they, they like to figure stuff out. Um, I love your reference to the to the PK, Christian. Like it's just a pivot, uh, and yeah. CEOs love that. Um, and so Dave was with Michael McCain uh, from Maple Leaf Foods, and they were part of a bigger discussion about you know these big issues that I was speaking to Canada's opportunity to produce more and export more of of everything. And they were walking out of it and just shaking their heads, saying like this. Grand Jamboree ain't going to solve this. Like we got to government and government's not going to solve this. We got to take this on. We got to like roll up our sleeves here. So they, uh, they brought in uh, other people in the food system, uh, sat down with farmers and producers and developed this idea of a Canadian Alliance for Net Zero Agri-Food that would be an industry led, uh, uh, an industry led approaches to solving uh, some of these challenges. So they brought in Galen Weston from uh, Loblaws, the country's biggest food retailer. Um, if you're going to have a value chain, it's got to go from the, the, the consumer to the store going backwards. Uh, the processors uh, brought in uh, McCain Food, the, the potato uh, company, Maple Leaf is more the, the, the pork side, uh, Nutrien, um, and built this, uh, th this really dynamic group along with lots of innovative farmers like you, Christian, across the, uh, across the country. And what we're trying to do, and we're really focused on action. Um, you know, there's important policies, and, but there's lots of groups working on that. We just want to literally get our hands dirty with this. And we focused, decided to focus, uh, we did a big project researching what are the levers for Canadian agri-food to produce more while emitting less. Uh, that's what I like to call Canada's moonshot. We can produce 25% more food with fewer emissions. That's, that's our moonshot. Let's, ma let's make that a national passion project. Um, 
Well, you, you do it through action, and one of the actions is, as we were discussing earlier, soil sequestration, but rewarding, finding ways to reward farmers for what they're doing. And it's not charity. We've got to create a model, um, we'll start with insets in the value chain where Maple Leaf or McCain or another producer will reward the farmer and then the retailer, Loblaws and others will re reward the producer and then the consumer will recognize that. So ultimately, I should be able to get a loaf of net zero bread <laughs> or whatever it's going to be called uh, yep. at a store and I'll be inclined to 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 buy that and then the, the farmer who began the journey of that loaf of bread gets rewarded for my purchase decision. Um, we think that's a, a really powerful um, economic model. The companies through the supply chain are also trying to address what are called scope three emissions. So not the emissions directly from what they do, but related to uh, how they uh, how they go about that. So rewarding the farmers becomes that offset, except it's within the supply chain, so it's known as an inset. Um, this is working in Europe. Uh, we, we think it, it, it can work here. And Christian, you, you, you said something once, which I, I, I think I really annoy people, but I'm going to continue to annoy them because it's so powerful. You said, when I get the check, I'll know this is serious. And so I, at our Kansas meetings or in other engagements, I hope you don't mind, <laughs> um, I use that line and I say, everything, we, like this meeting, this engagement, this project has to get Christian the check. It's not about you, Christian. It's it's a well, metaphor for like we got to get uh, reward the farmers. So that's what we're working on: creating a model, and it's complex. There's got to be measurement reporting and verification systems that are credible. Um, there's got to be good data, but you know th those are solvable problems. That's all part of the the moonshot. It's like NASA in Houston in the '60s. Like yeah, there's all sorts of problems, but that didn't stop NASA from getting a person to the moon and back by the end of the 1960s, which everyone said was absolutely possible. This is not as complex as getting a human to the moon and back. Uh, and we can do this and we have to do it as a country by 2030. And uh, you know, I keep hearing people saying, well, you know, we're gonna have to spend a few more years at this and that. And I'm like, no, no, like this has to be, those checks have to be flowing to farmers by 2030. Like that's. Uh, um, and that's one of our challenges as a country is we are not really great at that project management or that discipline. It's funny, I, I love your references to, to sport, Christian, because we're actually really good at it in like hockey. We bring together random people many, like in August um, and um, create a Team Canada in three weeks or maybe it's not up for the Winter Olympics, it'll be January. And like within, it's not even three weeks, right? In two weeks, they figure out how to play together and they're the best in the world. Uh, so we actually know how to do focused efforts, um, but we aren't so good at it in the economy. So I'm hoping Kanza, a lot of us are hoping Kanza becomes not just a great thing for agri-food, but it's kind of a bit of a model for the country of like, how do we just create these moonshots and just get shite done? Uh, yeah. In um, in a responsible way, but uh, but a disciplined way, uh, we're doing the same with biodigesters. So I've been talking exclusively about soil, but there's a huge opportunity in biodigesters, um, which um, I, I've spent a bit of time on in both Manitoba and Alberta. Um, uh, and one of the challenges for our country, another challenge for our country, is scale. Um, we don't have the scale that a lot of others have. Um, you guys are, are big scalers, um, but as you often know, Christian, most most farmers in Canada are very small. That's that's a challenge. It's not a it's a solvable problem through lots of collaborative efforts, which is what we're trying to do with biodigesters. But it's 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 an interesting interesting challenge. And then one of the things that really lit us up, I think, in a good way, with Kanza. And I hope it does this for Canada. Was the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, in the U.S., which you know was a wake-up call to Canada. Um, you know, the bear 
had woken up or the elephant, <laughs> whatever you want to call the US had woken up and was just not only putting huge am amounts of money through the, f through the federal government into all sorts of parts of the economy, hydrogen, uh, carbon capture, um, regenerative um, renewable natural gas, uh, RNG, um, but also uh, these other uh, uh, climate smart ag practices. And I had a maybe a bit of a wake up moment for a, a couple of a uh, couple of times. One was it was at COP at the UN Climate Conference, Christian, where I got to spend time with the um, uh, the U.S. Uh, Secretary of uh, of Agriculture, and it was just such an eye opener how for the U.S. it's it's just business. It's like uh, yeah, I mean I'm here for climate, but I'm really just here to to uh, help America American farmers grow grow more and do it. They call it climate smart agriculture. I thought, wow, that's like there go there go the Americans. They they know how to. <laughs> yeah. Um, back to our business question, like they were just like, we can actually grow more, export more, do more for climate, and make more money. And none of the none of that is mutually exclusive. In fact, you do all those together. Uh, and and it was really powerful to see an ag secretary out there, just as like a business guy. And saying, like, show me the money. Uh, so that was one one moment. And then I, I was in Manitoba with some hog farmers uh, just after Ira came out, and and they were talking about what was going on south of the border, and just this the speed that that dynamism of the American economy is something we need to really remind ourselves of of, of, of as Canadians. It's like when the U.S. gets focused on something, like we're seeing this in all sorts of fields, they move with a speed and a scale that we tend not to to um, focus on in this country. So we got to find ways of hyperscaling in a different way because we, we're not going to be 300 million people with that size of an economy, um, but there's other ways of scaling. Uh, and, but speed is entirely up to us. That yeah. We set our own speed limit. Uh, so if we're talking about developing like national biodigester networks or national inset markets for soil sequestration, moving to offset markets eventually, how do we ensure that we're moving at a spe the, the, the speed of the market, um, not setting a speed limit uh, that's going to hold us back? Now, I know, John, you, you're on a bit of a time limit today, so I don't want to keep you too long. So... Hebs, you want to you want to give a final question, and I've got one my own. Mine will be short, but yeah. give him give him kind of your conclusion question for today. And I, I'm hoping he'll come back on sometime because obviously we got <laughs> we got lots more we could go yeah. down. Let's put it that way. But you know, a couple key points I thought you brought up, John, is is one, you know, we're smaller than the U.S., so we should actually be able to be faster, and yet we seem to regulate more, right? Like. Good enough never seems to be good enough in Canada. We want to regulate it so that it has to be perfect, and then by then it's dead, right? And, and you and I have talked about this, right? And, and I think you, you talk about the check. I mean, is there anybody that says, show me the money more than the Americans? Show me the money, and we'll figure it out, right? Don't give me a white paper. That's a good spot for my coffee cup to sit. Show me the money, right? And and I think that's where, you know, this check to farmers is so important. And, and, and it's at a big level, too. I mean... I think you bring net farm income up across the country, it's like a rural revitalization fund. I mean, all our governments are trying to way to stimulate the rural economy. Um, last time I checked, farmers spend like 99% of all their money locally. That's, they, they can't, like the donkey died where the farm is, they can't really leave that spot. It's not that simple, right? So so I agree with you, I think speed is of critical nature and, and we need to get there with a collaboration between government and industry. Um, so if I had to ask John one last question, I would, We've talked about Kansa, we've talked a bit about policy, we've talked a bit about, you know, the opportunity of agriculture. So John, you're, it, it's, it's, it's nine months from now, and you've been asked to give a one pager with the top five things you do to allow Canada to grab its, its throne as a natural resource superpower globally. And the government says, we'll just implement them the minute you hand us the paper. You don't even have to give me five. I, I know that you'll have two or three kicking around in the back of your mind. What would you do the next morning? 
Um, brilliant question, and, and, and I'm not going to do justice to it, but uh, just a few thoughts off the top of my head. Um, number one, create a national test market for soil sequestration economic models. Well, that's not a very <laughs> good way of phrasing it, but like, let's just yeah. get going, giddy up, try this. There's no harm done. Um, let's, you know, no lives are going to be lost. No one's going to be harmed. Let's just try this economic model uh, and create, you know, a, a decent sized. It doesn't need to be wide open, but just a, a decent sized uh, model model for it. Um, number two, declare agriculture, agri food, to be um, an essential part of a national economic strategy. And I think you know, governments say this here and there, but it's like just boldly. There are three things we can win at in the world economically. One of them has to be agri-food. And lots of other things are important, but you know, the prime minister, the minister of finance, the premiers, whenever they talk, should keep saying, how's, how's ag going? Report back, show us the numbers, how, how we're progressing. Um, number three, infrastructure, which we, we haven't gotten into this uh, in, the, in this conversation, but uh, we got a problem. Uh, we can grow more, we can produce more, the world wants to buy more. Can we actually get it to the world? Not as reliably as we should. I had a, another wake up moment a few years ago when I got to meet with a Japanese delegation that was uh, in Canada. And it was so interesting to see the Japanese. They're just incredibly disciplined, focused. And they, uh, the chair of Mitsui was uh, leading the delegation. And they laid out essentially what they want from Canada over the next 25 years. We're going to need this much canola. We're going to need this much LNG. <laughs> on and on, like it was a shopping list. And they said, we really like Canada. We really trust Canada, and we'd like to buy more from Canada. We're not sure we can count on you to get us more. And I thought, oh my God, this is like the world's best customer that you could have, the Japanese. You know, so demanding of high quality, willing to pay for that, trustworthy. And they're saying like, you've got two rail lines to two ports. That's you know, that's one of our concerns yeah. as we think about where we're going to get our food for the next 25 years. That's got to be a, 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 almost a, an alarm bell for the country. Uh, so what do we, how are we going to solve that? Because we can, we, like, we know how to build rail lines, we know how to build ports, um, we're really good at, we know how to finance them with our pension funds, um, and we got the world's best kind of just this overabundance almost of, of coastlines and um, exit points for what we, what we produce. So that's got to be another sort of clarion call for, for the country. We've got to, infrastructure has just become a code word for everything. Um, we've got to just be focused on, no, we need more rail, more port. Uh, that's, that's sort of the key key elements of, uh, of, of infrastructure. We don't, have, uh, we don't have what we need to fulfill our ambitions uh, going out to, uh, out to 2050. Okay, well, my, mine's going to be a lot easier than that, John. So, <laughs> I mean, you spent, you spent a few hours out at the farm, obviously, a few weeks back. Uh, give me one or two key takeaways you took from there that, A, maybe you didn't know or you found interesting, and, and obviously you had some people with you, and anything they might have mentioned that they maybe hadn't seen before? Um, it, it was wonderful. I hope to c come back again and again if you'll, you'll, you'll have me. Um, so I knew this, but great to see it in person and something that Canadians, again, don't um, appreciate is how most farms of, of significant size in this country are serious businesses. Um, and we need to appreciate that um, you know farming is is a serious business it's a serious part of commerce it's also a serious part of innovation um, I mean you guys are both 
uh, sitting there with ball caps on and hoodies, and that's great. <laughs> um, but you're like CEOs. You run big enterprises. You could be in a suit and a tie. Um, you don't want to be, and I <laughs> don't begrudge you that. But um, we need to see our farmers as business leaders and take them as seriously as we take the CEOs of lots of different businesses across uh, across the country. Um, we need to see farming as an investable opportunity. And that's also an opportunity for the country. We've got big pools of capital uh, in the country. How do we devise better and better ways to ensure that that capital goes to folks like you uh, and innovative farmers across the country who can deploy that capital uh, and deploy it at, with a speed and a scale uh, that delivers market returns uh, for that. And it's not just on the investor and the farmer. We have to ensure that the re regulatory environment, the market environment, the trade environment all helps uh, helps uh, facilitate that. And then, I mean, I, I don't want to go on and on here. Maybe I already have, but um, it really s struck me so, like, how, how beautiful it is always to see like a working farm and a family farm, even though it's a, like a corporate operation. Um, it's a really important part of our fabric as uh, as a country. And Christian, like you've you've talked a lot about the need for rural communities. That that really s struck with me. And to invest in rural communities, if you if you lose the hockey rink, you're probably going to lose <laughs> uh, part of the the, the the farm family, and then things go south from uh, from 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 there. So we've got to continue to think about how do we help places like Musaman thrive and grow uh, because it's essential to all the other things that we're talking about. Uh, no Musaman, no farms, no farms, no exports, etc. cetera. Um, but beyond that kind of that community spirit, which is always a joy to be uh, to be part of, how challenging it is to run a farm and, and <laughs> You're saying, yeah, duh. But you know, we talk about how we need to get more people into communities like Musaman or to 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 take over farms um, or come back to the farm or invest in the farm. It's hard. Like it, it's it's um, uh, not just physically hard, uh, but just the the the, the business model uh, versus like starting a software company and <laughs> some city or town some, some, somewhere. Uh, and I, I don't mean that as just some sort of cheap observation. I think when we think about farming and the economic model, we don't appreciate enough, we really discount too much the kind of the inherent uh, or implicit um, time as well as energy that, that, that farmers put into, uh, into the work. So back to that question of balance, like just how to how to model it in a way that 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 ensures there's balance, lifestyle wise, economic wise, community wise, for the farms and the community of farms that are still an essential part of the Canadian fabric. I can I can kind of see why you two get along real well. I mean that that was probably the best answer <laughs> I've had to that question in my life. So. <laughs> Thank you, uh, thank you for coming on, John. I know you're busy, so it was it was nice to have you on and have these conversations, and obviously to see your viewpoint from off the farm and and how actually tied back into agriculture you, you are. Because we we have a whole bunch of professionals that we've we've interviewed and and had discussions with, and sometimes they're not, you know, they live in Toronto, they may not see the actual farm, but you you're very well spoken on the agriculture side. So I I definitely see that and appreciate that quite a bit so. well thank you both thank you both um this is such a uh, an honor for me to be uh part, part of this conversation i've learned a ton ton of jotted down notes here um but thank you all also for what you're doing to kind of elevate our understanding of farming and of ag agriculture but also kind of set a cool ambition um it's it's audacious what uh what what you've done and what you're 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 aiming to do and maybe it's part of that conspiracy of awesomeness but it's um it's awesome so remember, like, share, subscribe. Any comments below, guys, we, we use them on the next podcast. And I'm hoping, like I said, John will come back and see us in a bit sometime to, to answer a few more questions. 
And and remember, look at Maverick, Farmer Coach, all those nice things we like to sell to you while we're on here. And that's the truth about egg. Thanks for joining us. The Truth About Egg podcast is a proud member of the Heber Group, which includes Heber Grain Ventures, Maverick Egg, and Farmer Coach. We appreciate the support. Lastly, please like, comment, share, subscribe, and ring the bell. And if you have questions for a future podcast, please leave in the comments below. Thanks for listening.